praise, Lord, we give you all the glory. Lift your hearts to the Lord. Let's give it
worthy, worthy. We love your holy name. Give him praise, church. Give him praise, holy church. Lord, we thank you for your grace. Lord, we thank you for your blood, oh God. Amen. It's good to be in the house of God. If you made it out, you're in the right place. There's no better place to be than the house of the Lord, worshiping and lifting his holy name. Amen. Jesus Christ is worthy of our praise. He took a, He took the suffering for our sins. He took our cross. Amen. That's why we praise him for, because of this joy that we have, because we love our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We want to lift up some prayer today. We want to lift up uh, Summer, Levi, Ethan, uh, Garza. Amen. Uh, for, for salvation. Amen. And blessing. And we want to lift up uh, Dalia Caballero for salvation. Amen. And protection. That God's hand will be upon her. We want to lift up, amen, Andrew, Colt, and Shaddai for salvation, amen, that God will touch their hearts, amen. And as well as uh, our sister Rosario, that God will touch her kids and uh, do a miracle in them. We want to lift up Isaac Lopez and Danny Lopez, Genesis, David, and Stephanie, amen, for salvation, that God will do a miracle, that God will touch their hearts, amen. God is able. We want to lift up Rene and Gloria for breakthrough, amen. We want to lift up uh, Raul Sr. for finances, for breakthrough, amen. That God would help them, that God's hand would be upon our, our brother. We want to lift up our uh, sister Betty's family, amen, that God would do a miracle, amen, and your kids, amen, that God would reach down to them, amen, and just do a, a great work in them. We want to lift up Gacho, amen, for breakthrough. We want to lift up uh, uh, Ricky and Stacy, amen, that God yes, would, amen. would move upon them and use her for that precious couple of brothers and sisters, amen. We want to pray, church, for our nation. We want to pray for our president, for our vice president, amen. We want to pray for our leaders in all in all aspects, our pastor, the pastor's pastor, Pastor Warner, and uh, their families, Pastor Joe Rice, amen. And God will continue to give them wisdom, that God will bless their families. We want to lift up uh, the Mitchell family, amen. Yes. And pastor Mitchell is rejoicing in heaven right now, that God will lay their hand upon yes. them as our leaders of the fellowship. And that uh, God will continue to give them wisdom, amen, for Pastor Greg Mitchell as well. And we want to pray, amen, for uh, our community, for San Diego County, amen, for your neighborhoods, amen, that God would move powerfully, that God would reach areas like never before, that God would reach souls, amen, that God would just move in a powerful way and pour out His Spirit in these last days, amen. And we want to pray for, uh, we had a music scene yesterday. And that God would move, that every word that we yes, have spoken in truth amen. would not have fallen to the ground, but that it would take root in their hearts, that it would uh, it would, would uh, bear fruit, amen, that we would that we might reap the fruit, amen. Yes. And that God would be glorified in amen. Jesus' name. Amen. And as we do, we're going to have Pastor open us up in a word of prayer today. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your grace, Lord, for your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for your blood, Lord, that washes us clean, oh God. We thank you, Lord, for your gift of salvation, oh Lord. We lift up, Lord, every name, Lord, every request upon this list, oh God. Lord, that you would move, Lord, that you would be glorified, oh Lord. Lord, you move, Lord, you pour out your spirit upon these last days, oh Lord, upon our nation, upon San Diego County, Lord. Lord, we pray for the seeds that we have planted, Lord, for the labor we have done, oh God, that you would move, Lord, and you would be glorified, Lord, in Jesus' name. And Father, we just thank you that we're still able to gather in your house. We thank you for the grace you have shown this church. We pray that you would pour out your spirit this morning, God, that you would open our ears and open our eyes to hear and to see what you would say to us, God, that we would be a fruitful people established in your word, God, standing in dominion that was purchased for us through the blood of Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We, Father, put this service into your hand, and we thank you for your wonderful word that's going to be preached. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Why don't you say hello to somebody? Amen. We're waving to you out there in internet land. Thank you for watching. We appreciate you, Lupita. We appreciate you watching. God bless you. All those that are online, amen. Welcome to the Door Christian Fellowship Church here in South San Diego. You are in for a treat. This morning, amen, God is a good God. We just have a couple of announcements before we move on. So this, this morning and this evening, Pastor Herb Ruby will be ministering both services. And they're both going to be on end times prophecy. 
So, amen, you come tonight. It's going to be more of a Bible study setting, and you can ask questions, and we can interact and ask. So, listen, bring a notebook, amen, this morning. If you want to write down some questions, amen, tonight we'll go through that stuff. There's a lot of stuff that's going on that's not even in the news that I believe is, amen, fulfilling prophecy right yes. now. This Just this peace treaty that has been, amen, uh, brought with the EAU and, and um, sorry, the UAE, I think it is, and then um, Israel. That is just so, man, you guys don't know, Jesus come any moment, amen. Yes. Take off your seatbelts, amen, because Jesus could rapture you right now during this service because it is on, church. And so we're just going to be going through some stuff. It's going to be very, very good. Tomorrow we will have prayer here at 7 p.m. So be mindful of those things. And then looking out to the 17th is our um, fall festival. And so please bring a bag of candy. If you could have it here by Thursday, we would appreciate that so we can know how much we have, if we need to get any extra. Amen. So we've gone and purchased ours. If you guys can help, please bring a bag of candy. That would be a great blessing. And God will help us. We're believing God. And so bring unsaved people. We're going to have an altar call at the end of this. And we're going to reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ and believe that people will be saved and set free. So bring your unsaved family. Bring your unsaved co-workers. This is an opportunity for you to invite them to something that they normally would not come to. Some people don't like coming to a church service, but people will bring the kids. Listen, it's a kid's costume thing. So if you want to dress up, dress up, amen. So, but I mean, the kids are, can dress up in their costumes, and so they can come on out, and then listen, we're going to minister the gospel. Listen, you can show a, a De La Hoya fight and preach the gospel if you can gather a crowd. It don't matter. Amen. So, hallelujah. As long as we get people here, we're going to preach to them. And so that is our goal. Amen. And no day, understand this, no day do we surrender to the devil. Uh, no day do we send her to. He did not make any day. Try it. So Come nothing on. is his. Amen. And more than that, we're going to strip souls from him. Amen. So hallelujah. We've come to do business and we're going to strip souls out of the devil's hand and we're going to, amen, usher them into the kingdom of God. And that is what we do as a church. We take dominion and authority. So amen. Those are all the announcements. Oh, well, hold on one more. Remember, um, we're almost there for our translation equipment. If you can give, amen, push us over the hump. We're going to order that. I'm going to order it anyways. I'm ordering it probably tomorrow or Tuesday. Even if all the money doesn't come in yet, I'm believing God is going to be here by faith. So we're going to order that, amen. We're going to have 10 new headsets, we, uh, the transmitter, everything. It's going to be very, very, very nice, good quality stuff, amen. And so... Our church is going to be very blessed. And remember, we're still raising up money for our new building fund. Hallelujah. I saw them working on Toys R Us uh, the other day. And so I'm saying, amen, Lord, fix that up for us, dear God, in Jesus' name. <laughs> Let them put a ton of money and hand it over to us. Just hand us the keys. So, amen, let's believe together. Hallelujah. And then ushers, why don't you come forward? Amen. And we do have, amen, a visiting pastor. So we always seek to bless those who come and labor here. This church is very liberal. So if you want to give anything this morning for the pastor, please write that down. Love offering for Pastor Ruby. All that will go directly to him. Unless it's a lot, I may take half. I don't know. But it will so we'll, we'll see about that. But please give amen to Pastor Herb Ruby. Let this church be a blessing as it always is. And it, it is a pleasure. And a privilege to pastor this church. Yes. We are so privileged Amen. to be here. We love you and we thank you for all that you do. And we're just going to pray for the offering. Father, we ask your blessing this morning. God, we pray that you would shower your blessing upon Pastor Ruby. That you would bless him abundantly for his labor and for his faithfulness. God, you honor the man of God this morning as we give you cause it to multiply. God, and we know that you will meet every need according to your riches and glory. And we thank you for this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, church. Thank you for your faithfulness.
Pastor Ruby. Amen. Uh, I haven't known him that long. It's just been a few years, maybe four or so, five. Well, maybe a little bit longer, I guess. I met him when I was evangelizing. Amen. He would not have me. He looked at me and said, that guy will never preach in this. No, he didn't say that. Amen. <laughs> but Pastor, Pastor Ruby has been a great blessing into my life and my family's life. He has, uh, amen, just gives such great counsel and direction. Listen, you're never, you, you will never be saved so long that you don't need any counsel or direction. If you get there, then listen, you're lost. <laughs> because you will never know everything. And it's, it's good when you're able to receive from men who have been doing something a lot longer than you have. He's been a dear friend. He's a great blessing to us. And this morning, amen, he's going to bring it. So let's give him a warm San Diego welcome. As he comes on. church because God uses prophecy. That's why he gave it to us. It's been a crazy year. Uh, nobody saw 2020 coming like this. Oh. I, I told my church on uh, New Year's Eve, uh, you know, and, you know, I have to be much of a prophet to know it was election year to say this is going to be a year unlike, um, and, you know, unlike any in recent history. I had no idea what I was talking about. How, about how, uh, <laughs> how deep it was going to be. Yeah. I mean, I knew there was going to be a lot of stuff happening this year, but I had no idea. And it did, certainly didn't come the way I thought, but it has shaken people's lives. And I believe uh, God is shaking things and uh, we're seeing the fulfillment of many prophecies. You know, back during the Cold War, let me know what the Cold War was. Amen. Okay, there's a couple of you, amen. Let me forget my sermon and give you a little history lesson. <laughs> the Cold War was when America and Russia were at each other, and the threat of nuclear war hovered over our world. And um, you know, there are many different stories out of that time period, but they they came up with it, what they called the nuclear clock. This was uh, uh, scientists, uh, you know. Uh, people worked in government, and I think pretty sure it was an American thing. They may have had other world people involved, uh, but they have what they called the nuclear clock. And as things got hot, wars maybe breaking out, or, or you know, a lot of uh, tension between the Soviet Union and America, or proxy wars that were going on, they would move that hand up. And 12 was war. I mean, that was nuclear conflict, and so they would always, you know, you just side story in the news. Nuclear clock moved at two, two minutes closer <laughs> to midnight. And I think the farthest it ever got, as I remember, it wasn't like I was watching this thing every day, but uh, was like maybe two or three minutes before midnight. And I was thinking about that because if there's a rapture clock, amen, uh, amen. You know, that uh, man, rapture, you know, um, man, it's moved a bunch of minutes towards midnight. Uh, 
this year. And so uh, I thought prophecy would be a good thing to look at. So we're going to look at Matthew chapter 24 and um, read a few verses uh, together, starting with verse 32. And then um, we're going to come back and look at chapter few verses out of chapter 25 together. Matthew chapter 24, verse 32. Jesus, your Bible's like mine. It's all red right here. Jesus is, Jesus is talking about prophecy. And, and so we need to pay attention. Verse 32. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Surely I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And as the days of Noah were, so also will be coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour of the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And then, Father, we ask you this morning, God, help us. Father, have hearts sensitive to these things. Use, God, the, the uh, words spoken here in the spirit of prophecy to to goad us and move us into your will and into the, the uh, zeal of God for our lives, uh, especially to be fruitful in this generation. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now let's talk about prophecy. I'm sure you've heard sermons. I'm sure your pastor has preached and taught. Uh, and so, but you know, here's a topic that can't get addressed too often for us because it's important that we stay you know, aware. How many times did Jesus say, you know, watch and pray, watch and pray. So that's what we're kind of doing here this morning. We're, we're praying, we're watching, we're keeping our minds, uh, because the Bible tells us that it's very easy to get uh, so distracted by the things of this life and the problems of this life that, uh, you know, that prophecy, you know, loses its edge. Now, i got to admit, and these aren't even in my notes, this is all free. I'm not even starting my sermon yet. This is all, you know, uh, uh, I'm going to keep you about an hour and a half, three hours. I don't know. If I, <laughs> no, I'm coming back tonight, so I don't have to do that. But, but you, know, uh, um, you know, prophecy was a thing that got a hold of my life. And, uh, but there was a time that it didn't seem that big a deal. I've been saved. I've been saved a long time. I've been saved since 1979. Okay. Yeah, he was got the Man, back when four pintos roamed the earth. You know? uh, and so, uh, you know. Anyway, um, yeah, long time. And so, uh, that makes me a little bit old, I guess. That that's the point. But but my point is that God used this to get a hold of my life. But there have been huge. I don't know. I'm going to say decades, maybe. That didn't seem that big a deal to me, you know. Yeah, I know the rapture, and I'm in, and I'm always, you know, I'm aware of all the doctrines, and I even preach on it. But there wasn't that urgency that was there in the early days. But yeah. I'm going to tell you, it's here. Yes. And it's back. And so let, let's look at number one: the parable of the fig tree. Jesus taught in parables. He taught in parables because, uh, you know. He used common things. The Jews were really into agriculture, as you as you know, the parables and the family structure and relationships. And so Jesus used all of these things just to make spiritual points. A parable is a story that's simple to understand, but its meaning is spiritual. Its meaning requires thought and consideration and ultimately revelation. 
And so when Jesus says, I'm telling you a parable from the fig tree, you know, we might want to pay attention. Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark chapter 13, all of these are similar accounts of the what they call the Olivet uh, Discourse uh, when Jesus is teaching about the end times uh, and the tribulation period. How many heard about the book of Revelation before you were saved? You know, book of Revelation. You heard people talk about it at a party. You know, yeah, man. You know, and somebody start talking about the book of Revelation or something, you know. Uh, because, you know, it's out there. What's the main thing? You know, this is scary stuff, man. Book of Revelation stuff. Uh, and by the way, you know, there are people that have tried to, you know, interpret the book of Revelation while they're high on LSD. Not a good idea. You know? <laughs> That's where you got Charles Manson, by the way. He was really into the book of Revelation. Uh, and so, um, you know, it's a scary thing. And so, you know, but it, to think about this now. God dedicated a whole chapter. Now, granted, again, the symbolism requires knowing your Bible. If you're going to study the book of Revelation, you better know your whole Bible. I'm talking about the Old Testament and the New Testament. If you're going to understand the book of Revelation. But he dedicated the whole book to future things. See, God wants you and I to know that he knows the future. Yeah. He's the one who does know the future. Yes. Not that astrologer down the street. They That's know right. nothing. That's right. You know, they, they can't help you. Or that, uh, you know, that spread in that tabloid every year that come out at the end of the year. Uh, you know, the, the seer, the astrologers, uh, you know, the psychics predicting the year. They, you know, they, they know nothing. If they, if they swerve into something, you know, they're champion like they're, you know, John the Revelator, but they're not. That's right. In the 1970s, the first time I began to kind of consider this thing, way before I heard the gospel, a movie came out called The Omen. I know I'm dating myself here. <laughs> guy by the name of Gregory Peck, and I don't yeah. know who else was in it. I don't. I, I would ask for a show of hands, but nobody wants to admit how old they are, <laughs> so I'm not going to do that. But, but there was a there was a movie called The Omen, and it was actually a blockbuster. And it had to do with Damien, and who was supposed to be the Antichrist kid. And so, you know, they took this biblical theme and they made this horror film out of it. And this little kid, Damien, man, who's just a, you know, the most wicked, you know, kid, people dying everywhere he goes. And, and, you know, all that stuff. And, you know, I've seen him. <laughs> Damien's come to church a few times. <laughs> Uh, that's a term, you know, we used, uh, you know, but anyway, uh, but anyway, it just shows his life, and, you know, everybody that gets near him, he's, you know, he has this look in his eye, you know, this horrible little monster, and he's growing up to be the Antichrist, and so we went to the movies to see this, me and my brothers, uh, and, uh, and we had our cousin staying with us, and he was real religious, he was a Catholic, though, we were Catholics, and, you know, he used to do the whole thing, he talked about being a priest, uh, his name was Artie, and so he was the authority, and so, you know, we, we said, Artie, is this stuff really in the Bible and all this stuff? And he had no, he didn't know, you know, he didn't know that. <laughs> he, he started to teach us, you know, well, yeah, and he didn't know what he was talking about. But, uh, we, you know, that lasted for about a couple hours and then totally forgot the whole thing. Just another Hollywood thing. Let me tell you something. What I'm talking about is not some gimmicky thing here this morning. Yeah. This is not some Hollywood blockbuster. This is God saying, I know the future. Okay, he doesn't give us every detail, but he's letting us know. I, I'm telling you what's coming. In yeah. fact, Jesus, uh, uh, there were prophecies about Jesus for the Jews, so they would know, even yeah. though they, 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 were, they didn't receive it. Uh, but it's letting us know God knows the future, and he's told us. Amen. That's the main point you've got to get. I know it's simple, but it's very profound. God knows the future, and he wants you to know he knows the future, and he owns the future, and he owns you and I. And that's yeah. the point. Yeah. Lots of people have a vague sense of what's going to happen. You talk to, and as I said, especially here in America, average people, you mentioned Armageddon. They use Armageddon to describe everything. Antichrist, mark of the beast. But I'm going to tell you, as a Christian, God wants you to have a, a better understanding. Yeah, so Jesus taught powerful truths from simple parables so, um, you know, that we might understand these things, that we might be a spiritually inclined person. That's the whole point. And that we are people of revelation. 
The Bible is a book of revelation. Ephesians chapter 3 says the gospel itself is a mystery that's been revealed. Men have always wanted to know the future. When I was in high school, 1978, I was a senior in high school. And they, all the senior classes would get together and watch films. And one of the films they showed us was a film called Future Shock. Anybody remember that movie? Uh, some of the pioneer churches actually use this movie for their big three. Some of you don't know what that is, but it's okay. But, but they showed us what was coming, and they thought it was this radical thing uh, that they were going to show us what's going to happen within the next 30 to 40 years. And, and, you know, some of this stuff has come true. That's the first time I ever saw people predict gay marriage. Mm. Well, don't you know that was weird watching that uh, uh, as, as, as they were, as they were uh, talking about what's coming. Well, you know, God, God did a whole lot better than just 30 or 40 years. That's right. He's told us these things that he told the first century, but uh, it's really meant for you and I of this generation. That's why, you know, the ends of the earth, uh, or the ends of the ages, Paul told the Corinthians in chapter 10, have come on us. Well, I'm going to tell you, it's come on us. Yes, it has. John Holland, a, a preacher back in the day, said that this is a generation that's caught in the womb of time. In other words, uh, you know, we're, we are born and we are thrust into this generation. Uh, and I believe it's the final generation. I believe that since I've been a young convert. Uh, and so eschatology this morning uh, is the study of the end times. It's not some cheap uh, or gimmicky prognosticating. It's not some Hollywood thing. Uh, but it's God's way of getting a hold of people's lives. To give us greater understanding. And um, let us know that he's in control. Yeah. And God's people, amen, would find tremendous comfort even in the midst of tremendous turmoil. Amen. I mean, you know, it's been a tr troubling year, man. You know? Oh, preach it. I can't tell you how vexed I, 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 I've gotten at times, you know? I, so I talk to Julio. I call him and, and <laughs> tell him. And that, you know. I can't tell my wife because she's just in bed because she'll keep bringing up, you know. And so, but, uh, but it's just been so frustrating. And probably it's spiritual, as you know. By the way, uh, you know, um, uh, you guys are a bunch of lawbreakers here this morning, amen. <laughs> Just like us in Sacramento, the governor says you're not allowed to meet, and uh, you know, I'm thinking you shouldn't be allowed to be governor. That's that's my response. <laughs> that's right. But anyway, um, you know, that's what I'm talking about. It's a stress level, and you feel the imposition of uh, of. Uh, of people who want control, want power, and you're getting a little glimpse into the tribulation period. And so here in, in chapter 24, Jesus goes on this, what's known as the Olivet Discourse, uh, and he's responding to a question, tell us when shall these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? Jesus had no problem telling them and telling us uh, all of these signs to look for. He wants us to be asking these questions. He wants us to be looking. God's people are always clued in. This is even going back to the Old Testament. Uh, the, the Lord says to Abraham, Shall I hide from Abraham uh, what I'm about to do? He was ready to judge Solomon and Gomorrah. Many of us know the story. Abraham dealing with God because of his judgment that is falling on Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm going to tell you, if he was going to bring Abraham into it, he's going to bring you and I into it. That's right. Question is, are we in the place to hear? Joseph saw the future, we know. Daniel saw the future. Ezekiel, Zechariah, and others saw the future because this is God's way, and this is his method, and this is his desire. And so let's first of all talk about the, the fig tree for a moment. Learn the parable, Jesus says, from the fig tree. Verse 32, learn this parable. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. And you, so also when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. And so um, most Bible commentators agree that not just, you know, he's obviously making a statement about when, you know, uh, leaves start to come, you know that summer's coming, the fruit's gonna, about to show up, and so when you see these signs, know that 
the summer and you know the promised days are coming but it goes deeper than that it has to do with the nation of Israel in the book of Hosea chapter 9 and Joel chapter 1 Israel is likened to a fig tree and so when Jesus says uh, learn the parable from the fig tree he gives us real insight uh, and that uh, there's a very important key and that's the nation of Israel and he says, uh, surely this generation will by no means pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. And so for generations of Christians, they couldn't really make sense of the prophecies of Israel being a nation again. So many of them said it had to be simply a spiritual thing uh, because Israel was, many of you know, 70 AD, Titus came in, uh, destroyed Jerusalem, According to the prophecy, this was all prophesied, uh, according to the prophecy, destroyed the city, uh, destroyed the temple. Not one stone was left upon another, just like Jesus said was going to happen. Uh, and then for 70 uh, or for, uh, uh, you know, 1900, almost 1900 years, uh, Israel just was scattered. They what they call the diaspora. That means they went into all the world. They went to South America. They went to North America. They went to Europe. They went to Asia. They literally, Northern Africa, they literally filled the earth just like the prophets spoke about. And, but amazingly, in 1948, they became a nation again. Yeah. And again, all of this is according to prophecy. God told people that this was going to happen. And I don't have time to go over all the verses, uh, but do your own research. It's the most amazing thing Come on now. that Israel shall become a nation. The prophet, uh, one prophet said, shall a nation be born in a day? And that's exactly what happened. Yeah. 1917, there was a Balfour de Declaration uh, that uh, came from the British government announcing support for a future national home of the Jewish people, but you can make proclamations. Uh, people do it all the time, but there was quite a bit of obstacles in the way of this ever becoming a reality. In fact, uh, uh, you know, history tells us that uh, you know there was such a controversy around the Holy Land in Palestine uh, that they were looking at even South America to put the nation, uh, maybe find a place in Northern Africa. But you know, God's word said, no, no, back in their homeland. That's right. Palestine was just an outpost. Nothing big was happening there. It was just known as the Holy Land. Mark Twain visited, uh, very publicly visited the Holy Land in the early 1900s, and he said, there's nothing here. It's just, uh, it's a wasteland, uh, you know, uh, and that's the way it was. And yet the, the prophecy said Israel was going to be back as a nation, uh, and not just that, it was going to blossom and prosper uh, in, 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 in absolutely uh, monumental ways, and we've seen that. Our generation has seen that. Yeah. Something, you know, very big happened right before 1948, and that's the Second World War, right? It ended in 1945. It ended when Truman dropped a couple of bombs on uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki in two day period ended the World War II conflict. Germany had already been defeated. But most of you here know that um, what, you know, one of the main stories of World War II was the final solution. This was Hitler and not the Nazis. And it wasn't just them, it was others as well, leading this absolute uh, 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 slaughter of the Jewish people. They called it the final solution because uh, this had been their idea for for, 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 for millennia. Jews, no matter where they went, they got persecuted. Many of you know they got thrown out of Spain the same year Christopher Columbus came here. And, and they, a lot of them actually came to America. And, and uh, just on and on it went for the Jewish people. And that's why they called it the final solution. And they tell us over six men were slaughtered. Uh, you know about Auschwitz and Tribeca and all of those places, uh, the death camps. Uh, and uh, and it, was, it was as if the devil himself, uh, knowing the scripture, knowing the prophecy, says, I've got to get rid of these people because so much is tied to them in God's e e eternal uh, 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 record. And so, you know, that happened right before they became a nation in 1948. And so again, Jesus is saying, learn the parable of the fig tree. Pay attention to Israel. It's important. 
And so, uh, verse 33 of, of the scripture we read, when you see all these things, know that it is near, as surely I say to you, this generation shall not pass away till all these things uh, take place. Now, when Israel uh, won the vote, it's actually a very interesting story that you ought to read. When they won the vote at the UN in May of 1948, or actually, I think it actually happened in 47, November of 47 is when they had the vote, and then May 1948 is when they announced themselves as a nation. But, you know, they got a lot of sympathy votes because of the, because of the, the Holocaust. And it, was, and it was more of a, most people voting, or many at least, were thought it was a ceremonial type thing. Yeah, the Holy Land, Israel, yeah, the Bible, uh, you know, let's just, yeah, we're going to vote them a nation. But they had no real uh, expectation that it was going to actually be a real nation. Yeah. Anything's ever going to be anything. They thought, if nothing else, the Arabs are going to come in and, 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 and blow the whole thing up, which they tried, by the way. And so, you know, it was kind of a joke. Uh, uh, Truman talks about having to lean on nations. Come on, vote for it. Uh, you know, and having to pull some strings. Uh, and, you know, just, and, and a lot of people didn't take it that seriously. It didn't really. And yet, the Bible took it very seriously. Yeah. yeah. And when you see these things come to pass, know that it is near. And again, this generation shall not pass away till all these things take place. Israel has been in a, in a war of survival, right? As I mentioned, 1948. Uh, then again in 19, uh, there, was a, uh, uh, there was a a problem again in 50, in, I believe it was 1958. Uh, then again in 1967. Then again in 1973. I remember reading about the Yom Kippur War in 1973. I was, I was in junior high school, eighth grade, and it was October of 1973. And what the Arabs did is they, they attacked Israel on their holiest day. And the Day of Atonement. And, uh, and they, they were this close. In fact, and had they not been startled and, and held back for, I, I believe it was 12 hours that they stopped, they said, we must be going into a trap because we're moving there too fast and too easily. Uh, and so they, they, the fear kind of gripped them. I believe God gripped them. Uh, yeah. and, they, and, they, and they stopped. Uh, and, and they gave Israel a chance to regroup. Uh, and, uh, and Israel ended up winning that war, by the way, with Nixon's help uh, and America helping them. Uh, but uh, they've had these wars of survival for years. But I'm going to tell you today, Israel is a very powerful nation. Yes, they are. Wow. They're a very powerful nation. In fact, they tell us that they have one of the top four militaries in the world. So, in other words, people don't want to mess with Israel. <laughs> the big question is, does Israel have nuclear weapons? Yes, they have nuclear weapons. <laughs> These are the people, Jews are the ones who gave us nuclear yeah, weapons. That's, right. Right? that's not a controversial statement. You out there in the internet land, you know. <laughs> <laughs> They got them. They, they're very coy about it, though. They're like, uh, you know, uh, you know. Well, we're not going to say. You know, they've been saying that since the late '60s. Uh, but uh, they have a very powerful military. They have state-of-the-art technology. They're actually tech leaders. They're ahead of Silicon Valley in lots of ways. They they bring people in from Haifa, Israel. To uh, to uh, you know high places in our tech industry here, and so you know in other words, uh, you're not moving them without a major major battle, and they can do all the UN action they want, but Israel is embedded and they're invested in, in the Holy Land. God did this, uh, and there's a reason that uh, people are doing peace treaties. Pastor mentioned the peace treaty for the United Arab Emirates. Uh, there's a reason they're coming to the table because yep. Israel is tremendously powerful today, yep. and the United Arab Emirates uh, and, uh, and Saudi Arabia is coming there, and uh, I don't know who else is out. All of the Gulf states. And I'll talk a little bit about that tonight because that's definitely a fulfillment of prophecy that these things are happening. And so here we are, the the generation. And so there's always been this talk with us who've been around for a while, you know, about, about how long is a generation. Well, back in 1979 when I got saved, I thought it was 40 years. So 40 years from 79 would have put me in 2019. Uh, I mean, excuse me, I mean, one off in the wrong way. 
the generation was 40 years from when they became a nation. That's what the idea was. And, you know, everybody's a, you know, we were all armchair, uh, you know, prophecy experts. Uh, and so <laughs> 1948, and I can do math, 40 years, that's 1988. And so, believe me, everybody thought the rapture was coming in 1981. I tell everybody, you know. And I had throw him after that. <laughs> I remember telling one friend of mine, Bobby Perez, and uh, you know, I was witnessing to him, witnessing, and nothing was breaking through. I said, look, man, Jesus come back, and you got, at the most, this is like 1980, you got the most five years. That's it. You got five years at the most. He's definitely, maybe, probably sooner, but that's the most you got. <laughs> It was 1980. <laughs> I learned not to set dates, actually, is what happened, you know. I learned not to, you know. Um, but the Bible does say one generation. And so we, some of us get a little bit more liberal with the idea, well, maybe it wasn't the nation. Maybe it was when they took control of Jerusalem for the first time. Jerusalem shall be trodden of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And so that happened in 1967. And so maybe that's when that generation he's talking about started. Up. And so you start doing the math. And you know, I'm not here to be dogmatic about when it started. I'm just telling you, man, we're getting to the end of something. Yes, we are. Come on now. If a generation 70 years, that's some, maybe 80 years, I don't know. All I know is we are deep into the generation. Yeah. And so we need to pay attention. Let's talk about sudden judgment that's coming on the world. Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I want to miss down here pretty quickly. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. This world is going to be thrust into a sudden judgment. That's why Jesus says that uh, just like it was in the days of Noah, they were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. He did not know until that day came. You know? Preach it. Concerned about everything else. Yeah, I don't know. I got inside though. He's a nut. Yeah. That thing he's building. I, yeah, I actually worked on it. He, he contracted me. I did some work on it. <laughs> but man, the guy, you know, I don't know what he's talking about, bro. You know? No, I believe him. I think we got time. So okay. And so Jesus is saying that it's going to come upon us, uh, you know, unexpectedly. But concerning the time, verse 1, but concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. This is Jesus' words he's using. But he adds to that, he says, for when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them and the labor pains upon a pregnant woman. And they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. For you are all sons of light, sons of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep, as others do, but let us watch and be sober. And so, uh, uh, verse, uh, just going down to verse 9, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, who died for us, and when we wake us, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, well, just as you are also doing. And so here's that's what we're doing here this morning. The, the, the scripture says that you're not in darkness, that these days are going to take you as a thief, but sudden judgment is coming upon our world. Uh, and, you know, we're seeing, you know, you know, it's like coming into a city and you start to see the signs that you're getting close. You know, I've traveled, like your pastor, I've traveled to Tucson. I've been in California for years, ride to Tucson. And, you know, all, this, all the regular, you, and you know when you're getting close to Tucson, right? Not just because you see how many miles it is, but you see the signposts, you see the evidence. And I'm going to tell you what's happened in 2020 are signposts. Yeah. If you're paying attention, 
And people are, you know, are, are concerned about it. But Jesus said it's like birth pains. I, 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 I preached to our church in Sacramento when this all started to happen. Uh, and I said, I sense that this is a birth pain. That's, uh, you, you know, how many women here, here you, you've been pregnant, you know what a birth pain is. Amen. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, I'm not talking, what do we call Braxton Hicks and Faith Books? Yeah. Yeah. See, I know my stuff. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I had five kids. <laughs> you could be a real cool a real husband, you know. That's just a Braxton Hicks. <laughs> Slap you. <laughs> but how many know when the birth kings come, man? It's not like, uh, you know, I need to get my nails done. I'm going to get an appointment tomorrow, you know. Right? Yeah. Once they start coming, okay, the baby, baby's on its way. And everything takes a back seat. No other plans. I'm gonna battle what you had planned. I'm gonna tell you that's where we are right now. That's right. It's a birth pain. I know we got plans and nothing wrong with planning in life, but pay attention. When they shall say peace and safety, sudden destruction is coming upon them as a woman in labor. And what did he say? And they shall not escape. And so this year has been, as I said, a glimpse into the tribulation period. Yes. Now, I'm not trying to make a political statement here, okay? It can be taken that way. But there's something about these masks that really bother me. Right. I'm, and, and again, if you wear a mask, don't get mad at me. I'm not, I'm not trying. I'm not, where, if that's what you think you're best in, I respect you. I'm not, that's not my point at all. I have no problem with people wearing masks and uh, being careful and all of that. Don't take this the wrong way. But I'm really troubled when I see a government uh, that uh, especially one side of the government and knowing some of the things I do about these people uh, that they're mandating uh, and they're making this the highest moral issue of our land. Yeah. There's something wrong about that. Yeah. And, and, uh, and almost, uh, you know, their point is to bring uh, guilt and shame upon people uh, and, uh, you know, uh, put the dunce cap on your head uh, and that kind of, uh, that kind of thing that, uh, and, and begin to kind of uh, uh, pit people against another. I'm going to tell you, that's the part of this that's scary to me. Yes. As I begin to see how this virus is beginning to play out and the numbers uh, that, that uh, related to hospitalizations and death, it began to pretty be clear to be pretty clear on. I probably called your pastor event um, that uh, this is basically a government overreach. Yeah. And I was a lot more troubled by some of the stuff that our officials are doing, hello Newsom, than, uh, <laughs> um, than, than the virus itself. Richard. But we're getting a glimpse. Listen, you want to know what the tribulation period is going to be, uh, be like? Come on, we're getting a little glimpse of it. That's right. People that want to control you, people that are going to, they're going to, they're going to monitor you. I'm going to tell you, all of us should be terrified when we start talking about con uh, contract tracers. Yep. Yeah. They, they talk about it in the, in the uh, I don't know, we just want to make sure we're, we can uh, keep track of people who are sick. No, no, no. Just the first part of that is all they want. They want to keep track of people. Yep. Right. And with that, uh, put you under a microscope uh, and use that microscope to intimidate you to be the type of people they want you to be. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's what the tribulation is going to be all about. Yep. At the same time, there's lawlessness on another level. Yeah, no. High stress, people hating one another, people being pushed into camps uh, uh, and being polarized. All of this, I'm going to tell you, is a glimpse into the tribulation period that's coming. Come on now. Yeah. You know, I was uh, uh, in, at, at the home and I was at my computer and I was, you know, I'll watch various news on YouTube and uh, or watch some of our preachers, you know, a lot of people putting their stuff up. But you know how they give you suggestions, you know? Big Brother knows what you want, right? <laughs> you like this. We know what you've been looking at here, right? You like this, you know? And so this, this, um, this movie, I never heard of it. And it was obviously about the mark of the beast and stuff, you know? And so, you know, I kind of, you know, just kind of lazily just, eh, let's see what this is about. And I got to tell you, man, I, you know, I, I just kind of, Flicked on halfway through it, you know, just not even that serious about it. And um, it was the most hopeless movie 
I don't know, their budget was probably like 460 to make the whole movie or something. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just acting. You could tell it was made probably by some Christian who just wanted to do a, a tribulation era type movie. Uh, but my point is, is that before I would have I would given it probably around 10 seconds, <laughs> really, and then, then went off of it. But because of the hour we're in, something about it was just riveting to me. <laughs> and those these two teenagers that were running away from the mark, and then the parent come home, and the parents both have it, and and uh, you know they're, they're running, and I'm and my heart's going out to these kids, man, and, and you know I'm feeling all of that, and I watched the rest of it. I started at the middle, but I watched the rest of it probably right about another thirty minutes. People being rounded up, and man, this thing was resonating. Probably I haven't had that kind of reson resonating since I was a young convert watching yeah. the Big Three. And I'm not going to start showing them again, by the way, just for the record. I can't, I can't do it. You know? I told a pastor once, uh, I'll take the mark before I'll watch one of those again. You know, they got updated. Okay, so. But the point is, man, is that, you know, we're here. Yeah. Glory. The rapture, come on, come at any moment. Yes. And I'll talk a little bit about that tonight. First Thessalonians says, We who are alive and remain will be caught together with them and meet the Lord in the air. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. That scripture I read in First Thessalonians 5 says, God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. And so I believe in the pre tribulation rapture. Amen. It took years for me to even hear there was any other, you know. As you get along, a whole lot, brother, I believe in mid trib and then post trib. And so we tend to believe what we're first taught. I understand that. Okay? But do a little bit of study for yourself. It's not against the law to study your Bible. Is it? Right. Not here in San Diego, right? So, so, you know, do you know, but, you know, I believe in a, and I'm more convinced than ever of a pre-tribulation rapture. Yeah. That it could happen, it's imminent, it could happen at any time. In fact, I believe it's going to be one of the things that ushers in the tribulation period. And so, uh, Jesus is coming again. I bet people that say, I don't believe in a pre-trib rapture. They've been taught uh, uh, other things. Uh, and but I know they're serious Christians and they're saved. I said, well, even if you don't believe in it, you're going to go in it. I tell them, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Because and because they're I believe they're truly really serving God. Come on now. And so you know, you know, but there are people that do believe in it are going. So anyway, that's, <laughs> that's uh, let me close by just looking at one other thing. Go back to Matthew 24. And I'm not going to spend long on this. I could. I could preach whole sermons on both of these, but. I just want to skip over them because Jesus said all he did and then he gave us two more parables. And he began with verse 45. I, I think I started with chapter 25, but actually starting at verse 45, Jesus says, remember now, all the context, he's talking about being ready when he comes. Who then is a faithful wise servant? The master may rule over his household to give them food in due season. Blessed is the servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. I surely I say, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his good. But, verse 48, if that evil servant says in his heart, My master is delaying his coming, begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards, the master of the servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him at an hour that he's not aware of and will cut him in two and appoint him away with his portion with the hypocrites and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's the one that knows the rapture that's going to miss it. Amen. What, what led to that? My master's delay is coming. He's not, there's no urgency, there's no sense, uh, and there's no expectation, and, and it doesn't mean that much to you anymore. I'm going to tell you, man, this, the, the rapture is known as a blessed hope. Yeah. It's known as a promise. Right. Thank God for all the blessings in this life, but Christians are people who live for this world. And that's the, that's the tension, that's the, that's the battleground many times. Uh, and so uh, Jesus is alluding to people who know that the master's coming, but in their own hearts start to fall away. He calls it an evil servant, uh, an evil heart of unbelief. Uh, my master, and what does he begin to do? He begins to beat his fellow servants and eat and drink with the drunkards. Here's a very easy thing to, to interpret. 
your fellow servants, you're hard on them. You start to become very critical to your church and to Christians and, and to people. And, you're, and you know, But at the same time, you're finding solace with the, un, with the unsaved. You begin to beat your fellow servants, but you begin to eat and drink with the drunkards. I'm going to tell you, if you feel more comfortable with sinners than you do Christians, you better get your heart right. Because Jesus, he says... He says here's coming in an hour that you're not aware of. And, and God's not going to have two raptures, you know, rapture. And then, go, oh, I mean, I'm just kidding, man. You need to do better. And come on, you know. Yeah. I'm not tricking. There's only going to be a rapture, man. If you miss it, woe unto you. Yes, come on, man. Man. And the next one has to do with the five foolish virgins. Five were ready. Five weren't. <coughs> they, knew the, they knew the bridegroom was coming. Five were not ready. Oh, they knew all about it. A lot of people who know a lot about prophecy. But they're not serving God. Their hearts aren't right. There's no Holy Spirit filled life. There's no uh, up to date experience with God. There's no relationship uh, with God's people. There's none of that. Their place in the church is falling away. But the bridegroom's going to come, and he'll go, oh, I'll, I'll get ready. I'll be ready. Oh, no, no, I'll see things happen. I'm going to watch the news real close. When I see things, up, I'm going to get my heart right. Yeah, good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> because Jesus is coming, folks. Mm -hmm. And we need to be ready. Bow your head with you. said in Luke 21 pay attention take heed to your own heart I said anytime your heart's be overcharged with drunkenness or worldliness and cares of this life so that that day overtakes you there's so many warnings about that don't let this day overtake you we're not in darkness Paul told the Thessalonians. We're people of the day, people of understanding. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. That got my attention as an 18 year old. There's actually a rhyme and reason to this world. It's not just all oh, just some cosmic accident of craziness. We're not just evolved of apes trying to figure life out. So many people who've accepted that live lives of total destruction and ruin because it's such a lie. You're created in God's image. And he's given us these prophecies to know that the word of God is true. The devil hates the Bible, but I'm going to tell you what he really hates is the prophecy because that exposes that God's in control. Yeah, that's right. He wants to have his own narrative. Jesus is coming. And so as we're in this place, maybe you're watching by live stream or whatever you're watching is, God's dealing with you about being ready. And that's really what I sense here as I preach this message. Be ready for Jesus. That means obey him. Surrender to him. Live for him. Walk with him. Be ready. And he's calling his church home. Maybe you're here this morning and your heart's not right with God. There's no confidence. There's no assurance that if he called his church home, even before the end of this service, that you just have an insecurity about that. But you want to pray this morning backslid or unsaved and God's dealing with you maybe watching this on a streaming, live stream God's dealing with you I'm going to take time to pray if you want prayer, lift your hand up and pray all across this assembly
We're the ones that all this is written to. Take it seriously. Be watchful. Watch and pray. Watch and pray. Watch and pray over Jesus' words to us. Don't be like that one who doesn't know when the thief comes. And that day, two are going to be two are going to be in the field. And one's going to be taken, and one's going to be left. It's going to happen suddenly. When they say peace and safety, sudden destruction comes upon them. And so we're seeing so much turmoil. It's wobbly. It wouldn't take much to really usher in a very, very difficult period in world history. We as a church are called to be ready. Let's stand across this assembly. We're going to be bringing this service to a conclusion. But before we do, we're going to worship God again in some sorrow. When you want to take time to pray or you can pray at your seat or you're welcome to come to this altar. If you're at home or you're watching this, take time. God's dealing with your heart. Get on your knees. Begin to pray. Begin to talk to the Lord. As we worship God together. Amen. Let's sing this song through us. Give a prayer.
such a ploy of the devil to get your mind off of God. Remember the ten virgins, they all knew, and at one time I believe they were all ready, but then five got so distracted that they got left behind. And the world is always seeking to distract you, whether it be with pleasure, or whether it be with this pandemic. And listen, at first, everybody was so aware. You know what? Jesus is probably coming back, and now everybody's forgotten about Jesus again. And they're more focused on how many cases, and Jesus is completely wiped out of their mind. And you cannot let yourself be distracted. Amen. You ever been distracted and driving and gotten direct? Yeah. Come on. Amen. I remember I was at a gas station, and I was, I was on my phone, then I dropped my phone. And I didn't, I didn't know I dropped it as I was getting back to my truck. And so I'm taking off and, and oh, where's my phone? And then I, I kind of look back and I see it. So I have my door open on my truck and I'm backing up. And I hit the pole that's there. And I bent my door all the way over against my truck. <laughs> because I was distracted. And so I had to bungee, bungee cord my door. I wasn't going to pay to fix it. It was an older work truck. So I would just drive and it was bungee cord shut, amen, from one door to the other. I would just jump in the window and get underneath the bungee cord and drive it like that too. Because I had my own business, so that was my work truck, so I didn't care. But you can get so distracted that you become so bent, you miss God. God, come back tonight, amen, it's going to be very good. Amen, there's going to be a time of uh, questions and we're going to... And ask questions, and I'm sure we can open up to other questions after, amen. Her Ruby says, you know what, they can ask me about anything in the world, I'll give them the name, amen. So, but listen, you guys can come and ask questions, and if we have an answer, we have an answer. If we don't, we don't, we'll, we'll, we'll find one, amen. But just come back tonight, amen, be encouraged. This day, be mindful of Jesus, and be mindful that there's somebody probably in your path that doesn't know Jesus, so witness to them. Amen. Be mindful that there's people that are still lost and they're waiting for somebody to give them the answer. And the answer is Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. We're going to bow our heads.